All right, I guess let's get going. Uh, so it's we're back at this again. Um, uh, today, instead of uh, talking about sort of the, the rough outline and basics for DIA, I thought we would talk about how to analyze DIA and also how to acquire DIA and what sort of settings you would want for a more modern style of DIA than this sort of 25 MC wide window um, nonsense that really no one actually does much anymore. Uh, okay, so uh, yesterday we talked about how DIA was a compromise between PRM and DDA um, from the standpoint of getting targeted like uh, quantitation yet still being as comprehensive as DDA is uh, to measure an entire proteome. Um, and I think that uh, to start this off, it's actually uh, probably worthwhile showing you this reference, which is uh, by Jared Egertsen on designing a DIA method. Um, uh, this uh, protocol is actually a, a very good place to start using DIA with Skyline specifically. Um, and does designing experiments. Uh, this is starting to get a little dated because it's from 2015, but conceptually a lot of the, the right ideas or stuff you want to think about is embedded in this. Uh, we've also put onto the web, uh, onto this Bitbucket account, a, um, uh, a file that uh, is kind of like a quick start for how you would set up an instrument and how you would get going um, using some basic software. Um, so this will all be in the uh, when you get the actual handouts, you'll be able to grab that link. Okay, so yesterday we talked uh, very briefly about um, peptide-centric searching versus uh, uh, spectrum-centric searching, and I thought we would kind of recap this a little bit and talk about um, uh, some more details about this, because I think there was a little bit of confusion, uh, a little bit of complexity around here. Um, so uh, the first thing that I thought we would talk about would be spectrum-centric searching and actually go through probably one of the, the more common spectrum-centric searching methods for DIA data. So again, this was uh, how you would typically analyze DDA data, where you ha would have like 30 to 50,000 spectra, and then see which peptide in a protein sequence database uh, lined up best with that spectrum, and then report one peptide spectrum match per uh, spectrum that you queried for. So every spectrum gets a peptide, and, uh, and then you have to decide afterwards if that's a good or, or a bad match. <clears throat> so another way to sort of think about this is, uh, and this is sort of the, really the only way I think we've come as a field to be able to think about DIA data from the standpoint of a spectrum-centric search, um, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why this was the first approach that had been uh, sort of genuinely used in the field for analyzing DIA. Uh, but you would take this fragment space data where you have a bunch of these fragments that are associated um, with each other in retention time but not in mass, and then generate from that what are effectively pseudo spectra with a precursor mass that, um, that effectively look like a DDA spectrum because you know that the precursor and the fragment ions co-elute with each other and then treat that as if it were a normal, pep, uh, a normal spectrum in a DDA search pipeline uh, using Sequest or Mascot and being able to decide what peptides are present using whatever sort of normal software that you've got in your lab already. Um, and DIA Empire is probably the, the most widely used tool, but it wasn't the first tool to do this. PLGS, as we talked about a little bit earlier, was another tool that was designed around the same concept uh, uh, maybe about 10 years ago. And so the, the strategy here would be to look at the, the precursor space. So this is just like a normal um, precursor scan where you've got retention time here and MZ in this dimension. And we're used to thinking about peak picking in this space normally because we do this a lot for DDA work anyway, for doing quantitation. So you would come up with a list of precursors that you found here, and then for each one of those precursors, you would basically look to see was there any fragment ions that happened to line up with that precursor exactly. Um, and if there were, then you would pull them out and say that they were 
part of a, a fragment space that was associated with that precursor, and then you would say that that's a new structure. Um, this is the figure from their from the Alexi's paper. Um, basically, there the idea is that you would correlate in um, uh, in the peak shape uh, how well the monoisotopic peak, so that would be the precursor peak here, lined up with every fragment ion that was present at about the same time, and if you decided that you found a bunch of fragment ions that would be associated with that precursor, well, they would also potentially be associated with other precursors in that space, too. So, for example, these blue precursors could be associated with this guy here, or they could be associated with this shoulder here with the purple. So, um, you don't necessarily know, and so you would develop what is a, a, a weighted space that says, I am, you know, 90% confident that this fragment ion goes with this precursor, maybe 70% confident it goes with that precursor. Uh, and then decide from there um, what is a reasonable, like, precursor to fragment um, uh, uh, graph or network. Um, and then when you've got your precursor and then the fragment ions that you think are fairly well associated with that precursor, uh, you combine that into this uh, uh, precursor MZ charge pseudo spectrum. And that pseudo spectrum, because everything coalutes, it behaves pretty much the same way as you would expect uh, a normal DDA spectrum to behave. There's actually a lot less noise in these spectra um, simply because it's pretty hard or pretty unlikely for um, uh, two peptides to have, you know reasonable precursors, reasonable fragments that collude exactly on top of each other in the same space. It does happen, and so you end up with these situations where you might not necessarily be able to decide exactly where it goes. In those situations, you end up searching all of them. Typically, when I run DIA Empire uh, on a DIA experiment, I might generate maybe twice as many spectra as I generate with a DDA uh, experiment, um, and so that that uh, additional complexity or the two times uh, increase in the number of, of pseudospectra is actually just because of this um, uh, inability to exactly assign precursors to fragments. Okay, does that make sense? Do you guys have questions about this approach? No, so this is not, this doesn't use a spectrum library at all because you're basically making pseudo DDA like spectra from your DIA data and then searching it with a normal search engine. So it doesn't require a library. Because you could just use Mascot or Sequest or X Tandem or whatever that you, you would normally use for DDA. Um, and it works fairly well, actually, as a strategy. Uh, uh, the one sort of major caveat to this is that it requires a precursor that is associated with your fragments. And we talked yesterday about why you might not necessarily see a precursor every time for your peptide. Um, and that's definitely, we find that to be definitely the case with DIA data in a lot of cases. Um, that, in a sense, we find that this approach, while it does work, it's usually less sensitive than if you, uh, if you don't require a precursor signal. Uh, so, so uh, essentially, you're doing some sort of a correlation between the um, the time aligned. So, uh, one way to think of it is that that this peak shape is essentially a frequency shape, and so you can use normal correlation metrics to be able to decide, you know, that are used in electrical engineering to decide if they're the same or not, or they're the same signal or not, um, and so that's. Uh, pretty much what they're doing here. We're actually going to talk a little bit about a different approach to do that, um, pretty briefly. Uh, but yeah, it's, does that sort of make sense? It's actually, it's a really simple process. Um, the, the problem is, there are a lot of false positives in that approach as well. Uh, just because, you know, it's hard to decide what a good cutoff and score actually is. 
Um, and so you end up with these sort of complicated graphs where you know, you're really confident that precursor one has fragment two, but you're not so confident that it has fragment four, um, but you still gotta kinda use that, you know, based on the, the weighting here, that, that weighting. So, that makes sense? Yeah. Is this information somehow preserved after you ran no. the it's gone. It's gone. Um, it would actually be sort of interesting if you were to, and this is something that I had wondered why they hadn't done, actually was to just incorporate a database search engine at the same time and search this sort of natively. That's effectively what PLGS does, uh, and maybe one of the reasons why that method has worked well for Waters. They also have a lot tighter control over their data in general, just because they, they're the instrument vendor that's working on the same software. So. Maybe that's unfair. Okay. So that's all I'm going to talk about spectrum-centric searching. Uh, I'm honestly much more interested in this pet bed centric searching where you don't necessarily need a precursor. Um, and so, again, that's the idea where you would take a bunch of peptides in a list, you would extract out MSMS uh, signals for each one of those precursors, decide uh, based on a score where you think there's enough coevolution of these precursor scores, and then call it at that time point, or fragment scores. Okay, and yesterday I showed you this slide, and just to recap, um, uh, you would take that score distribution, and you would look for a maximum here, and then you would decide that that is associated with your, your fragment ion uh, set that is assigned to that peptide. Um, uh, but to kind of go over the harder problem that we were talking about earlier, which was sort of deciding what peptides are, are necessary. Um, we kind of, we discussed this idea of using all triptych peptides and then decided quickly that that was maybe a not so good idea. Um, and that it would be better off to use this DEA spectrum library or something like that. Uh, I, I put up with this note here that you must control the FDR because we, we saw situations where it was really hard or you were getting a lot of false positives. Um, just by looking for every single peptide. Uh, you still really actually need to control for FDR in all of these cases. And I thought we would talk a little bit about that, um, uh, false discovery analysis of DIA data specifically. So um, a lot of you guys have seen this slide or slides like this. Uh, this is just the, the sort of standard target decoy approach where um, you have uh, a list of peptides or a set of spectra that are assigned to peptides um, that you're, are, are, you think are natural peptides that are potentially in your sample. So some of them are going to be in your sample, some of them are not going to be in your sample. Um, the, the idea here is to come up with a list of alternate or, or decoy uh, peptides or spectra that you know at least are definitely wrong. And so, while you can't say something about this blue distribution or these blue peptides, you can definitely say that these red peptides are wrong. And it, it's kind of like a way of injecting a null hypothesis into your experiment to be able to decide if it's a good, um, if any individual peptide is a good peptide. Uh, so, I think one important question is, uh, how do you generate a decoy spectrum? It's, pretty obvious how you would generate a decoy peptide. You could take that sequence and scramble it, or you could take that sequence and reverse it. Those are probably the two most common ways. Um, generating a decoy spectrum is maybe a little bit more complicated, but conceptually it's about the same idea. Um, the idea would be you take a sequence like this uh, uh, for your peptides. This would be a target peptide in a spectrum library that I just pulled up last night. Um, and you would do a reverse of that. So. Um, Keeping the, remember how we were talking about how Y1 and is really common, B1 is really common too. You know, that's one in 20 amino acids is gonna be B1. So both are really common. So you don't wanna accidentally switch a residue like Y1 out because it would give you kind of a false assessment of what Y1 would actually be. So you wanna keep Y1 where it is, you wanna keep B1 where it is. But all of the other fragment ions you can swap. So here I've just taken this. Um, it goes P N L P 
P-A-E-T going backwards, P-N-L-P-A-E-T going forwards. So it's, a, it's just an internal reverse, keeping the N and the C termini the same. Um, so one of the things that, that, uh, that Skyline does is it does this sort of reverse, and it keeps the intensities for all the fragment ions that you would expect. So Y1 is always the same intensity as Y1. B2 is always the same intensity as B2. But now its mass is in a different location based on what you would predict uh, for that mass. So here, B2 would be associated with VA, and here, B2 would be associated with VP, so um, a little bit higher in mass. And so if you look at this, so B2 here is going to be pushed a little bit that way, Y2 uh, is pushed down this way, um, Y12 is pushed up that way, that sort of thing. So the masses are changed, but the actual intensities are kept the same. Does that make sense? That way we can keep the shape of the, uh, the spectrum such that it looks like an actual decoy. It looks like a real spectrum, but we know that the sequence underlying it is fake. Okay. Um, the other thing that, uh, that is important to consideration, uh, consider is that if you're retaining noise in your spectrum, um, so for example, open swath tries to retain at least some uh, additional features in the spectrum that you wouldn't necessarily be able to associate with a, or some, uh, some approaches uh, try to keep a uh, fragment ions that you know coalute but you don't necessarily know why they collude, because the, you can't say that it's necessarily a BIN or a YN. Many of those things are internal fragments, and they make sense to keep with the spectrum. Um, but in those cases, typically, we try to keep those in the same place, because we don't know what mass we should move them to. Um, another thing is that if you've got mass errors associated with your library, so for example, if you're maintaining a library that's, that's not uh, uh, where the, the fragment ion masses are not assigned specifically to um, uh, VA in this case, or VAP in this case. Uh, we, you, you need to maintain the error along with each of one of those fragment ions. You can't have one spectrum that has mass error and another decoy spectrum that doesn't have mass error. Okay. So, yeah. Is there a, like, reverse versus shuffle? Is there any kind of... Yeah, um, I haven't actually looked so much into that uh, that specific issue. Um, the assumption, so if you look at the uh, the literature that's out in in a DDA search analysis, um, typically reversing and shuffling doesn't really matter as long as you're doing them within the peptide. So if you um, if you shuffle across a protein or shuffle across a proteome, as in like do a random draw from that, then that can be dangerous. Um, and the reason why is because peptides are made up of different, or proteins are made up of different things. So for example, uh, uh, a hydrophilic um, a peptide that's, or a protein that's designed to sit in the cytosol is going to do different things or be ex uh, ex um, sent out into the, um, the ether is, is going to have different physical chemical properties than a peptide that's going to be like embedded in a membrane that's, that's really hydrophobic. Uh, and it'll have different amino acid compositions, especially different amino acid compositions in specific regions, right? So um, that's one of the reasons why you want to, if you're going to do a shuffle, do it internally. Does that make sense? So, but from that perspective, I think that uh, shuffle internally versus reverse internally is not a big deal. Typically what, what we do is, um, is do a reverse and check to see if that reverse is the same or pretty close to the same as something that's already in your target list. And if it's really close to something that's in your target list, then shuffle. Does that sort of make sense? So you don't want to you don't want to have your decoy. You want your decoy to look differently than your than your targets. You want it to look similar, but you want it to look different enough so that you can distinguish them. Does that make sense? Is there an automatic check whether the decoys are not present by any means as a real peptide in the protein? 
Uh, yeah, so that's basically what I'm saying. So it's it's less about the proteome and more about your target list in that case. Um, uh, so I don't know that Skyline actually does that check. Uh, I think of them as a tool to generate everything for this cross-check with it. Yeah. Uh, Pecan is another tool that we have in the lab that also does a cross-check, too. It does? It doesn't do proteome Oh, within that experiment? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say you should keep the mass errors, I, I didn't expect them to use them in the Is it well, it depends on uh, so so there are, there are multiple ways in which you can decide how you build your library. Uh, I think the way Skyline does it is, and Brendan, correct me if I'm wrong. It actually corrects the masses in the library to the right mass. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and so that's in that case there are no mass errors, and so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and that, I think, is probably the safest strategy, but some approaches just take the spectrum as is, as it's been detected by the search engine. And then if you do that, then you need to maintain wh whatever mass error there is. Okay. Okay. So um, the way in which scoring in Skyline, as well as in MProfit in general, uh, which is used by a lot of different engines, um, the way... Uh, uh, scoring works is actually a lot like how you would manually validate uh, peptides that you would go through. So the things that you would think about when you are sort of manually interrogating a, a match is you would look to make sure that the fragmentation pattern um, in your library spectrum matches what you actually see uh, from your raw file. And so uh, they've uh, we've generated a score here uh, that's associated with that, and you would expect high scores to be good, and so there's this distribution of red and a distribution of blue, and the distribution of blue is pushed that way. But there's actually a lot of overlap, and there's going to be a lot of overlap in a lot of these cases, um, because uh, not always is a spectrum library spectrum actually perfect, like a perfectly aligned match to what you expect. So this is one useful score. Another useful score would be, does the retention time match? And so here you would expect low retention time deviations to be strongly associated with targets. Again, it doesn't guarantee you that it's the same thing, but it does give you a lot of evidence that it probably is the right match. Um, a third thing would be, uh, does the, the signal to noise look pretty good? Um, so here you would expect a high signal to noise ratio to be associated with targets. This one seems a little bit more um, uh, specific in this data set, but it might not necessarily be in another data set that's a lot more noisy. Um, I think one important thing is that all of these features that we've talked about, all of these scores, are imprecise. They're not perfect, and they don't totally discriminate everything. Um, so the strategy that MProfit has uh, taken is to generate a whole bunch of these different uh, scoring features and, uh, and decide, basically, of these scoring features, can we generate a synthetic score, a combination of those scores, that actually gives you the best discrimination. So they do this with a method called linear discriminant analysis. It basically just adds, it takes these scores and adds coefficients to them and just sums them together. Um, some scores end up going in the direction you would expect, and some scores end up going in the direction that you wouldn't expect. Uh, and I think one of the things that Skyline has done nicely is that they show you when a score goes in the wrong direction or a direction that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, and we'll actually see a bunch of this in the demo or the, the tutorial that we're gonna do um, after the break. Uh, but basically the idea is that uh, MProfit and Skyline generate this composite score, uh, which is basically the, the combination of all of the discriminators in this list. Um, and in that positive score, you would expect, uh, from the combination of all those scores, to be able to separate fairly well these targets from these decoys. Um, and the idea here is that if you assume, and I think this is important to underline that this is an assumption, if you assume that this decoy distribution is, uh, is actually um, 
uh, respects what your incorrects look like, then you can say, okay, well, how far away are you from this incorrect distribution or this decoy distribution? Because that's sort of a, a representation of what is incorrect in your library or analysis. And everything that's pushed above here is what you think of as correct. Um, so there's the assumption that your targets and your decoys look exactly the same, and therefore their score distributions should look exactly the same. That's an important characteristic. A second important characteristic is that in mProfit, there's an assumption built into mProfit that this distribution here is uh, normal, is a, is a Gaussian distribution. Um, there's not really necessarily a reason why you would want to make that assumption, um, other than the fact that it was originally designed for SRM data, where you wouldn't necessarily have enough um, targets or decoys to be able to build a, a really good distribution, so you would need to make some kind of assumption here. Um, but one thing I think uh, um, is worth looking at when you look at these distributions in Skyline with mProfit is is this distribution normal, and does it reflect what you think of as the incorrects for your, um, for your experiment? But the idea basically is, since we're assuming this is a normal distribution, you can just ask how far away is any one of my peptide matches from that normal distribution, and then you've got something that's much more akin to like a t-statistic or, or a normal sort of, um, uh, and allows you to generate a, a p-value from that. Okay, does that make sense? We're gonna actually go through this uh, by hand uh, using the tutorial in a little bit. Okay. Um, one thing that I want to note is that it's really important to calculate protein level false discovery rates as well as peptide level false discovery rates. Um, and this is something that I think you still have to do after the fact in Skyline, is that right, Brendan? Yeah, um, but it's important to at least know that that doing analysis at a protein level, it, if you're trying to analyze proteins, then doing false discovery correction at a protein level is important. And the reason for this is, if you've got a whole bunch of peptides, and here I've just got some blue peptides and some red peptides. Let's say the red peptides are wrong and the blue peptides are right. Um, and that in this case, eight of the 10 are right. Um, so 80% of these peptides are real. Um, one thing that is normally the case is that peptides that are correct aggregate together. So um, you will see multiple peptides that are assigned to the same protein, and you would mark that protein as being correct. And you would see a bunch of peptides that would be assigned to another protein, and you would mark that peptide as correct, or that protein as correct. However, the, the incorrects are assigned randomly across the database. So um, if you get a random peptide detection or an incorrect peptide detection, it's going to be uh, a randomly decided what protein it belongs into. And so consequently, you don't get the same aggregation effect as you do at the protein level. Um, and this is important because now we've taken what we thought was an 80% correct detection rate and now turned it into a 50% cor uh, correct detection rate at the protein level. So. Uh, it's important that you at least consider what your protein level um, detection rate actually should be based off of what you've assigned as peptides. The other way to sort of get around this problem is just to do all your work as peptides or think of peptides as markers for whatever you're interested in and never do an aggregation to a protein level. There are a bunch of different reasons why you might want to do that as well, and I think Mike is going to talk a little bit about that later today, why it might be worth thinking of peptides as your analyte of interest rather than a protein as your analyte of interest. Uh, I'll put one quick thing. I always think that when you're trying to say what is the parsimonious list of proteins you have, it's always worthwhile doing this, this aspect of what's present. <laughs> when you're doing quantitation, I think there's a there's, there's really good consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay. How to do this, this aggregation? Um, I won't actually talk about that. Uh, it's usually better to let the tool that you're doing sort of do that work. Uh, and that, I think, is something we probably would want to think about in Skyline. Um, 
pick up on a comment that you made, you use quantitative information and protein inference. Is that something that will, will come at one point where you say that, that if, if peptides can be co-regulated, that there's additional evidence that they... We'll discuss this, I think, a little bit during the yeah. uh, later. So uh, I think you're doing a good, a good point. How, it's a how, hard problem. How excited can I be? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, let's well, just discuss it a little bit later. I think I think so it's so semi excited. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so I think it's a hard problem, and yeah. I think that you know a bunch of people have tried to tackle this. Science yeah. has tried to tackle this, and I think um, they've they've made the the most thorough stab at it. But it's still pretty rudimentary, okay. um, and I think that you know it's something we're still thinking about rather than actually putting into practice. Uh, maybe putting into practice in very specific cases, but maybe not globally yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you're if you want to do that, that's still a lot of manual work. Okay. All right. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, quantitation and quantitative uh, uh, analysis, or things that you need to think about specifically with DIA. I know that we've talked a lot already in the course about um, doing quantitative statistics, and we're going to talk more about how to do that specifically with DIA. So. All I want to talk about is how you actually generate good numbers, rather than how you uh, develop good tests for whether something is differential or not. Because um, uh, we'll talk about that later in the course. Um, so one of the things that's actually pretty important is that if you're dealing with multiple samples, you need to, do, you need to think about retention time alignment. Um, and so that's effectively being able to draw curves through your data. Um, typically, we need to do this uh, work um, uh, if we're using, uh, if we're trying to combine uh, a search with a, um, uh, so a library assessment versus a, a uh, retention times that you've got in your, your data set, um, there, there's lots of reasons, and we talked some about this, about why you wouldn't necessarily expect your library retention times to be exactly the same as your actual retention times, specifically if the retention times have been converted into the IRT space. So we have to do things like try to align those together. Um, you also need to do this alignment between samples as well um, to, to be able to detect a peptide in one sample and then call that peptide in another. Um, the approach that uh, we've sort of gravitated to and is now in Skyline is this kernel density approach where basically the, the idea is to sort of think about this as if you were thinking about it with with your brain or with, with your eyes. When you're looking at, at uh, a bunch of peptides aligned between a retention time in a library and a retention time in your raw file, um, you would gravitate naturally towards the density um, or where you see a lot of points together. And so that's basically the, the underlying idea of this algorithm. It's really trying to put each of those points is to make each one of those a little distribution and then to sort of stack all those distributions up and to effectively build a mountain of this retention time space. So that's what I've depicted here in three dimensions. So you can see like there's this incorrectly aligned sample in the library that matches weirdly in this stretch. You see that ridge right here as a, as a ridge. Um, the kernel density approach that, that we've been working on or, or have incorporated in Skyline and other tools uh, basically starts at the highest point here and then walks down that ridge surface all of the way down, and that's the way we do retention time alignment between um, a library and a uh, and the sample that you're analyzing, or between samples um, with each other. Um, it's a there you can use like a linear analysis, but I think this kernel density approach is better, and it's now an option that's easily accessible in Skyline. Another, I think, important issue is one that was brought up by Hannes Roast in this Nature Methods paper, which is that over um, time, as you're acquiring raw files, you'll get a little bit of drift in your chromatography setup. Um, and that can actually be a bit of a challenge when you're trying to decide if something is present or absent, and whether absent means you're integrating the wrong location, or if absent means uh, that it's really not in your sample. Um, and so you'll see that that peak that you want to integrate actually shifts around from time to time in different samples. 
It won't shift a lot, just a little bit. Um, but the approach that Hannes came up with was to draw uh, these retention time alignment curves, just like how I was talking about with the, the kernel density, and to generate a score for how close one run is to another run. So the idea would be to say, this run isn't that close to that run in time, but it's pretty close in time to this run. Um, and then this run is close to this run and not really close to these guys. And so effectively to score how close each run is to each other run. And from that to draw effectively a network where you've said, I have identified most of my peptides in this one center node and this one center sample. And then you say, how far like, how far, how many retention time jumps do I have to go to be able to align a peptide from here to there? Um, and then it tries to build the shortest, what they call a spanning tree, to decide um, how, how many of these sort of retention time alignments do you need to go through to detect the peptide that you found in, in sample one to make the call that it was actually present in sample three or, or not present in sample three. Um, another important thing is uh, algorithmic de uh, ways to decide uh, whether a, um, a transition is good or not. Um, if you've done any Skyline work so far, you know that the, the part that takes the longest is not the importing, it's the manual validation to make sure that all your transitions actually are good or give you good quantitative signal. Um, we've been working on different approaches to uh, to come up with manu or, or automated ways to do effectively what your brain does. Um, so if you had a bunch of, of uh, transitions that you found here that sort of, you, you, you detected a peptide at this location, um, how do you decide what, A, the boundaries, the integration boundaries are, and what transitions to use? Um, well, you know that some of these are clearly interfered with it. So, to start. Uh, the approach that we've been working on is to integrate each of these. So basically make sure that they sum um, to, to uh, the same value to one. So to take all of the low transitions and then normalize them so they integrate to one. Take all the high transitions, normalize them so that they integrate to one. Um, so that basically all their areas should effectively be the same. So if all their areas are now the same, then the transitions that actually line up uh, or that, that have the same shape should line up pretty nicely along a curve here. And the transitions that don't line up well will have weird different deviations. So for example, there's this transition here that really has no signal in the integrated region that you're interested in or a very little signal in that region. And so its normalized area is pretty weird or pretty off. Um, and so, like, for example, this transition here is heavily interfered with on the side, um, and you would want to, to be able to call that. If you do this sort of normalization, it's pretty easy now to be able to say, well, there's a bulk of, of signal that follows this line, and therefore, those are all the transitions that we think are actually pretty good. Um, and again, this uses an approach that's pretty similar to how your eye would use it to be able to say that those are all the same. So we come up with a way to describe what the shape of the majority of those transitions are, and then we ask the question, how well do any one of those correlate to the, to the sort of aggregate measure? Um, and then from that we can decide, well these are the transitions that we actually want to integrate, and then these ones in red we definitely don't want to integrate. The ones in yellow are the ones that we, we think are, are reasonable to give us good detection, but probably aren't good for a doing as a quantitative measurement. Um, so this is an approach that uh, we've been working on the side. It's uh, in a program, um, Encyclopedia and Pecan. Um, it's something that we're working to get into Skyline shortly. Uh, it's just a matter of time to get this sort of thing in. Um, is that? Yes. So you, you smooth it, then you normalize it. How do you smooth it? There are a bunch of different smoothing algorithms that you could use. Um, it's 
all of this is really sort of normal electrical engineering signal processing. It's not the sort of thing that, uh, it's not unique to our field. It's stuff that's been worked out 50 years ago. OK. Um, I've talked a lot about computational methods. I thought it might not be a bad idea to uh, spend some time talking about how you actually run an experiment um, before we sort of dig more into the, the details of how to do statistical analysis and that sort of thing. So um, yesterday, uh, we talked about uh, how I think about a third of the class was using uh, TOPS and two thirds was using um, uh, QEs or, or thermal instruments. Uh, my background is in, in thermal instruments, so I'm mostly going to speak about this from a thermal perspective. Uh, but I'll make points as to when it's it's appropriate to think about it in a different way for a talk. Okay. Um, there are a lot of different considerations that I think are important for uh, for developing an experiment. And we talked a bit yesterday about this question of, of six to eight points across the peak. That we, you definitely need six to eight points across the peak, otherwise um, uh, you can't derive a quantitative signal. And so I wanted to actually show you why that is. Um, so here, for example, is a peptide that's measured by five points. Um, uh, and that measurement, I think we would all agree, is probably pretty faulty uh, in terms of coming up with a, an integrated area. Um, if you were to do this sort of integration, the way uh, uh, Skyline does this and the way basically any integration software works is to derive what we call trapezoidal areas. Uh, so this is sort of like Riemann sums, if you remember back to like intro calculus. Um, but the idea is to just come up with the, the trapezoid that represents the, the points in between those. And you're going to get some error in these measurements, right? There's going to be error up here. There's going to be error over here. Uh, those errors are, um, uh, uh, you would hope as a whole would cancel out. Um, and so... The question is, at what point do they start canceling out? Um, and it's about six to eight points across the peak. Uh, so here I've drawn the number of points across the peak, and this is the number of points across just a Gaussian peak, um, a synthetic Gaussian peak. And this is the percent deviation in that area using the trapezoidal measurement versus knowing the true area from the Gaussian. Uh, and what we find is that just from sampling alone, uh, we end up with pretty significant deviations if you start looking at lower than six points across the peak. Um, and that really this range right here is the best, I think the most reasonable range, where you're still going to get in some cases deviations of 5% quantitative error just because of how you made the measurement at six points across the peak, but in, in those cases for the most part we feel like that's acceptable. But you definitely don't want to be in this region where you've got five points across the peak. Um, so, uh, and realistically, when we set targets for doing analysis, we typically want to achieve 10 points across the peak for the majority of our peptides, because uh, realistically, the peptides that are in the center of your gradient are going to be um, spread across quite a bit more, um, and the peptides that are at the beginning of your gradient and at the end of your gradient usually end up being a little bit more compressed. So if you've got 25 second peptides in the middle of your gradient, you probably have 15 second peptides in the edges of your gradient, if that makes sense. Yeah? Is there a way to skyline that you can see the peptides? Yes, yes, there definitely is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a toggle that you can do to show you, um, at least in an integrated point, it will show you different, uh, the, the, not the number, not N, but it will, show you all of the different dots for what it shows to do the integration on. And so you can see it. Oh, oh we have N now? OK, great. OK, yeah, yeah. So you could definitely do an export to, to CN as well. Uh, so I did calculate this myself. Um, there, there is a paper that sort of discusses this concept from the 70s. Yeah, Hayes and Matthews. Yeah. Right, yeah, it was Mike Scrad's uh, uh, 
professor's uh, work. So, yeah, it's a great paper. Um, they actually, I think, mostly advocate for using 30 points across the peak or something like that for an analytical peak. Uh, we feel like we can get away with six to eight points across the peak from this sort of analysis. But again, I think this is an important thing to remember. I'm just trying to do this with a Gaussian here, right? This is a perfect peak that I, uh, I'm making an assessment of. It's not one of these weird peaks that I get from a proline um, or, or some, something that's unusually fast or has weird tails. Uh, so six to eight points across the peak uh, around a Gaussian will give you like a reasonable measurement. Um, if you are talking about the weird peaks, the weird peaks you probably need more uh, uh, points across the peak to be able to really call the shape of them. So also fig figure five in the long run, and our Okay. So um, Rudy talks about 400 to 1,000, uh, 400 to 1,200 mz um, shrunk down from 400 to 1,600 and chops off the 1,200 to, four, uh, to 1,600 range basically from his DIA analysis. Um, I, I actually have been mostly talking about 400 to 1,000 in my slides, uh, and uh, I think it's important to ask the question of why we've got these differing opinions. Um, so here I've just plotted the precursor MC, and this is just the number of peptide identifications that you can make using DDA out of this. Here's another representation of that precursor MC, and this is just the integrated precursor tick. Um, so the total uh, ion current um, that's at that precursor mass. Um, and one of the things you can see is that this has a sloping distribution here, and that this region, 400 or 1,000, is probably the sharpest region, and that there's a lot less signal up here in this 1,000 uh, 1, to 1,200 range. Um, and so, in general, I feel like this here is probably not worth going after uh, to develop measurements. Uh, specific, specifically, if you are as constrained as we are in terms of our cycle time, but we need to get enough scans across that I would rather focus more on this region and get more scans in this region than try to get scans up here. Specifically because we believe that the stuff up here, you might get really good plus two signals for it, but you'll probably get a plus three signal for it in here, or a plus four signal in here. And that even if you can't exactly measure it, you'll probably get a pretty good uh, measurement of a different charge state for that kind of thing. Um, However, there are lots of reasons why you might want to choose 400 to 900 or 500 to 900 to nail in on a certain region here. Um, and it, it might make sense, actually, 400 to 900 actually seems like a fairly good square fit around that. Um, but let me show you what this, what this would actually mean like if you looked at real data. Uh, so here, this is looking at narrow window data. So just uh, 2MZ wide isolation across. And the way I built this was actually just adding on more and more acquisitions. So this was a sum of, of four acquisitions. This was five acquisitions, six acquisitions, seven acquisitions, uh, uh, eight acquisitions um, to build up my precursor rank. So what we do see is that normalized to this uh, 500 and 900 rank, um, we do see an increase in the number of peptides you can detect in these types of samples as you increase the, the range size. So you do get a bump here to here from 400 to 1,000 versus 400 to 1,200. I, 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 there are peptides that you can detect up there that you can really only detect up there or that you can only safely detect up there or successfully detect up there, I should say. Um, you do get a huge bump from you know, from 500 to 900 to 400 to 1,000. We feel like that's worth going for, but the, this extra range, you know, that you still get some additional benefit from that. I think one of the, the issues, though, that that plot sort of obscures is that you have to spend more cycles to scan in the upper range. So here, if I do wide window data or single injection data um, and keep the cycle time the same, so the the number of points that I have across the peak, I need to keep that consistent. Um, 
then that means that I can do from 500 to 900, I can do 50 8MC wide scans, or I can do 50 10MC wide scans, or 50 12MC wide scans. And if you're going up to 400 to uh, 1200, you're really talking about 50 16MC wide scans. And really the extra interference that you get from having those wider precursor isolation windows actually kind of kills you in the end. And that really the sweet spot we find is this 400 to 900 or 400 to 1,000 range uh, as being the optimal um, uh, search space to get the most number of detections uh, reliably out of. Okay? Yeah. Extra injections. So uh, the way I built this was I ran 400 to 500 as one injection. 500 to 600 as one injection, 600 to 700 as one injection. So this guy up here has eight injections associated with them. They're across different search spaces, so you can actually just aggregate them together and treat them as one analysis. It's not like DDA in that regard, right? Um, which is actually, I think, a really big benefit of DIA. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so you can aggregate like that, but if if for your quantitative data, you still want to do that as a single injection or maybe two injections at most. So, what do you think about the variable of variable Yeah, uh, I have some comments about variable windows. We'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, I think there are some benefits and some drawbacks as there is with all of these trade-offs. Uh, okay, so um, I've got a, uh, a methods document here where I've set up appropriate methods um, for you if you're using a variety of thermal instruments uh, to, to get going. So basically, you know, ideal starting spots for window width and margins and ion injection times and resolutions are already pre-specified in this doc. Um, as well as windowing cycles that we think are optimal for thermal instruments. Uh, one thing that um, I do want to say is that I, I've got the section for TOFs, and I, as I said, I'm, I'm not a TOF expert, uh, but more importantly, I think that uh, the TOF vendors have been much more uh, keen at developing their DIA platforms, and so they actually have much better specifications for their specific instruments than I think you would get from some random schmo like me. Um, however, I think Thermo has been kind of slow to this game and hasn't released good metrics for where you should be acquiring DIA. Um, so, uh, so this is a list that I think is a good starting spot. Uh, again, um, actually I think this list here is a little bit outdated. You should go to the actual methods page. Okay. Um, for those people that are using thermal instruments, I just want to talk briefly about uh, the instrument configuration here, because I think this actually has an important play in how you make these decisions, or why you make these decisions. Um, so in an orbitrap, this is just a QE, but a, 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 a tribrid instrument is the same thing. It's just got this ion trap on the end that you would basically ignore when you're doing the IA. Um, uh, so uh, you would inject ions in here and then accumulate them in the C-trap and then put them into the orbitrap. The things that actually matter are the C-trap where you're accumulating ions and the orbitrap where you're actually acquiring a mass spectrum. Um, the idea is that these things work in parallel, right? Uh, where you can accumulate ions at the same time you're acquiring ions. So uh, in your first cycle of ion sets, you'll accumulate um, a series of ions, and then you'll inject them into the orbitrap and measure them here while you're accumulating the next batch of ions to come in. And then you're going to swap those out, um, throw away the ones that are in the orbitrap, you're going to put the new ones in the orbitrap, and then you're going to start filling in this C-trap again. This is exactly like what, Bru uh, what Rudy was talking about with the TIMS device, um, with TOFs, and I think this is this concept right here of having a trapping device is huge, and one of the reasons I think why Thermo has done well in, in collecting this type of data and why I think the TIMS device is another good like step forward in this avenue to build a trapping device on top of a top. Um, uh, I think long term that's a really good strategy, uh, whether they get the methods straight 
soon. I, we'll see what happens there. Um, but this, uh, this sort of like uh, push-pull method um, has been in the works at Thermo for a long time now, where you're accumulating ions and then measuring them separately. Um, this has some interesting ramifications here. Uh, so this is a, a figure that Jared Eggerson generated, um, where he was measuring in the CQE uh, at different resolving powers how much time it would take to uh, accumulate ions versus how much time it would take to measure ions. So measuring ions at 15,000 resolution in the orbit truck always takes a certain amount of time. It always takes, you know, maybe 20 milliseconds. And the measuring ions at 30,000 might take around 60 milliseconds. And the measuring ions in this, uh, um, in, at 60,000 is going to take like 120 milliseconds, something in that rough range. Um, and, uh, and what he kind of figured out was that if you set your ion injection time at a certain level, uh, that's weird. Let's get back to my actual presentation. Okay, good. Um, if, if you if you actually track for like thirty thousand resolution, at a certain point, if you stop injecting ions uh, or you stop injecting ions early, you're still just waiting for the orbit trap to keep measuring. Um, and you're wasting time. And this is one of those ideas that Rudy was talking about, that I'm still needing to figure out with the Tim's talk, how you can optimally not waste time on it. Um, however, if you are injecting for way too long, it doesn't really gain you anything, because you, um, you, you basically end up uh, spending all this extra time injecting ions and then probably throwing them out afterwards. Uh, um, because you, you're really needing to scan the orbit trap at a certain rate and it needs only a certain number of ions. So measuring how many ions you actually need is, I think, important as well. So um, from this, he actually determined these are pretty good center points, I think, to use, at least on these devices. So this is how we came up with all of the, the choices previously, um, so that you don't really have to do that, was the idea was to, to run either try to run the instrument at 30,000 resolution at 10 hertz, and then use 16 milliseconds of, of measurements, um, or to do it up here at uh, 20 milliseconds using 15,000 resolution. Um, one of the things that I want to point out uh, pretty strongly is that uh, realistically on, on the sort of older QE instruments, um, so the QE, the QE+, plus, the QEHF, uh, and the fusion, the classic fusion, um, 20 milliseconds isn't enough time to be able to acquire enough ions to get a good spectrum. So for those instruments, you really are fixed at this 10 hertz acquisition because you need to acquire uh, ions for at least you know 50 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds to get a good spectrum. Um, this setting only really works on the more modern uh, QE, so QE, HFX, and the fusion LUMOS can actually operate at this 20 hertz genuinely um, and be able to, to, to deal with only 20 milliseconds of ions. Um, so, yeah. Is that because the orbit trap is somehow more sensitive? Or? No, uh, it's, it's actually due to ion routing and the fact that on the, the LUMOS and on the HFX you've got this giant gaping hole in the front of it. Um, so it, it actually can accumulate ions it, it, it has a br what we call a brighter beam. It can accumulate ions uh, and use all, like I think 90% of the ions that are actually coming into the mass spectrometer, whereas you end up with loss um, as a result in the, in the QEs with the older ion funnels. Is that, that, Mike, is that probably a good? The main thing is just it's a true ion funnel. So this factor nine guide is, a, is an RF ion guide, but you actually have to do three separate injections into the sea trap. Uh, because they don't have a broad transmission across the mass charge, because it was the ion pearl and the ion pearl, so there was broad mass charge that could bend their time from one to Actually, yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so. Um, so uh, one thing that's actually kind of interesting to note is that 60 milliseconds ion inject time actually doesn't make sense for 10 hertz, right? 10 hertz would mean that you would have 100 milliseconds of ion inject time. Um, the reason why you actually have that overhead uh, is actually in routing ions around the mass spectrometer itself. 
Um, so it takes a certain amount of time to move ions from one place to the other, and, uh, and that's where that extra 40 milliseconds comes from. And that's why you have that 30 milliseconds loss up here, too. Okay. Um, running at 24MZ uh, wide windows, um, we have some different strategies for making this a little bit better. But it is important to note that you do actually end up with a lot of interference. And then what we find actually is about 30% of the peptides that we can detect um, with much more narrow uh, uh, inter uh, levels of, of measurement. So here, for example, we've got 6MZ wide measurements or 3MZ wide after our overlap deconvolution, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, here we actually can, for the most part, detect three transitions for the vast majority of our peptides, 90% of our peptides. Um, however, if you're doing this with the 24 MZ wide overlap or 12 MZ wide effective uh, isolation, um, only, only about 70% of peptides you can actually get three transitions for, for quantification. Okay. So, um, building these schemes, we're actually going to go through these, uh, this a little bit, so I'm going to go through this a bit fast, but I want you to see it ahead of time. Um, uh, in transition settings in Skyline, you can actually build these windowing schemes pretty conveniently, I think, here. Um, and so you can select uh, Add in the transition settings for isolation scheme. It actually generates uh, this ability to calculate based off of a windowing set. So here I've got 400 to 1,000. 24 wide windows, it pre-calculates that I want 25 and, uh, windows, and you can do different things with deconvolution and optimization, um, which we'll talk about in a bit, but then you can nicely graph it and, and be able to show yourself this is what that scheme actually looks like, um, and we'll go through some examples of what that actually does in the, um, in the tutorial itself. Uh, but then you just basically take that list here that Skyline has generated and then stick that into your method editor um, up here in the inclusion list. Uh, you just click on that and then paste it in. Um, and then basically you're done with, with setting up your DIA method. Um, I do have uh, uh, this sort of slide for reference of when you get the actual copy of the slides, um, if you don't have them already. Uh, you know exactly where in the settings list that I've written out where to actually insert what value, um, because it is a bit different on the Fusion class instruments and the QE instruments. Again, this is not necessarily something useful for the, the top people here in the room, but um, I think hopefully is useful for some of you. So there's settings for MS1 settings, and there's settings for MSMS settings, and I'm not going to go through them. It's just here for your reference. Okay. So one thing that I mentioned just a little bit about uh, ago is... Uh, overlapped windows or staggered windows. Um, and I think this is an important concept that uh, this was quite recently published um, uh, by Jarrett Eggertson as well, actually. Um, and I think this is, this is a really cool scheme um, to make uh, DIA actually a pretty effective uh, tool for isolation. So here we've talked about collecting precursor scan, 400 to 1,000, and then collecting these wide window fragment scans. Um, what Jarek came up with was this idea of looking at those window boundaries and shifting over every other scan and then adding one on the end, and um, and then doing this for every other scan. So you would do a normal offset, normal offset, normal offset, one after another. Uh, and so one of the things that's kind of cool about this is you can say, well, there, this is this basically makes my duty <coughs> cycle twice as long, but I get information from this half of the scan that I know is going to be present over here, and then this half of the scan is going to be present in this other window. <coughs> and we can actually use the staggered uh, aspect of this to be able to, um, uh, to, to be able to do some extra special math to deconvolute this data. Um, so I think this is a, a, a great strategy for being able to do this, and I just want to walk you through this a little bit. So if we've picked like this random 24 MZ wide window here, and then these would be all the fragment ions that would be associated with it at you know a random time zero, um, and this is a, a measurement from 600 to 624, just an arbitrary range. So uh, if you look at the previous and next scans, you can see ions like this red ion that are present in both the previous and the next scans. 
you could say, well, I don't really know anything about this ion. I know it's um, that it's present all the time in all of these scans. But there are going to be some ions that are like these guys in green that are only present on the early scans in this early set of the window. And so for those, you can say something about it. You know that those probably only exist. They don't exist up here in the 12, uh, 612 to 636 range. They only exist in this 588 to 612 range. So you know because they're found here that they actually only exist in 600 to 612. Does that make sense? It's a way of effectively cutting the window in half. You can do the same thing with the other side. So these are the blue ions that are going to be on that side. And uh, you'll also get some ions, like these ones in orange, that are not present in either the previous or the next scans. Those are much more likely to be noise than anything else. You can actually discard them and clean up your spectra um, significantly. So you can generate a spectrum that has you know, that red ion we didn't really know what to do with, and only the green ions as being 600 to 612, and the red ion and the blue ions on this side, 612 to 624. So it's a way of effectively taking your 24 MC wide windows and breaking them into half, effectively for free. Right? This is only done from a computational perspective. And this is actually is a really cool technique. So here is an ion extraction at 20 MZ wide for this ASAP peptide, and this is what it looks like. It's kind of garbage, it's got a lot of interference, a lot of noise. This is where the actual peptide lives here. And if I look at the 20 MZ wide overlapped data, or staggered data, it cleans up significantly. Um, and I can say, well, that's definitely a much easier thing to integrate than this kind of messy thing over here. One of the things that's pretty cool is, if I look at just straight 10 MZ wide data, um, it looks exactly the same, right? This is interference over here. It's the same interference that we were seeing over here, too. Um, so it effectively gets you uh, half um, the precursor window size for free, just from a computational trick. Um, so we, we strongly advocate for thinking about this strategy. This is, I think, a really good strategy, easy to implement in the lab. Uh, another thing, as Brendan mentioned, was this idea about variable width windows. This is something that Rudy's group has actually um, uh, gone in pretty heavily on, um, and I think is a, an interesting idea. The idea basically is to use sort of wide windows in the beginning of your scan, and then sort of smaller windows at the, um, in the middle, and then wider windows at the end uh, before repeating again. Uh, this is sort of like a crude example of that, uh, but the idea is if you have fewer ions up here and fewer ions up here, or on the lower side, that you can sort of ignore, like you can give wider windows to those sections um, and, and deal with the fact that they're wider because you expect there to be less interference up in those ranges. And you expect there to be more interference in these ranges and so you have to spend more time in those ranges to make them more narrow. Um, so, uh, uh, this, I think, is a good strategy. Um, uh, it, I think one issue with this is that uh, because you've got these variable with windows, it means that you really can't do the, uh, the overlapping trick or the staggering trick that we talked about. So it's like an either or, basically, for that. You can either do staggering or you can do um, these variable with windows. Uh, one of the reasons why I would advocate for the staggering one is because um, uh, one of the sort of issues that Mike will talk about uh, in a bit is that you'll have peptides that are oxidized or peptides that have um, uh, sequence variants or very similar homologies with other peptides that are shifted typically by methyl or by uh, uh, oxygen. Um, and that mass range is uh, a a pretty small mass range um, in deviation. And so in these wider windows up here, you might be able to, or you might end up mistaking an oxidized peptide for an unoxidized peptide, or a homologous peptide with uh, the peptide that you actually care about. Um, and that's why having sort of fixed regular windows across the entire scheme, I think, is a safer bet. Okay. Uh, one important consideration for these variable with windows is that you can't really just use uh, straight canned uh, methods because depending on the type of experiment that you want to do, um, you might want to make different decisions. So for example, here I've drawn 
mass uh, uh, mass of charge bins here across from 400 to 1200. Um, and then this is the percentage of peptides that are in each of those bins. And if you look at the pan-human library here, this is just all of the peptides we would expect in a normal human proteome. It's centered mostly around 550 in its mass to charge range. But if you look at a phospho library where you've added an extra 80 mass onto every peptide, obviously it's been shifted over. So that distribution is actually a bit different. Um, so you actually want to draw your variable with windows differently for um, your uh, for your normal proteomes where you might have a lot of space up here on these sides differently than you would for phospho where you might actually want more space on the lower end, for example, on those ranges. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, window margins um, is something that's pretty important. We talked yesterday about this issue of having a sort of trapezoidal transfer uh, in quadrupoles where you end up not being able to transmit as well um, ions that are on the, the sides or close to the window boundaries um, as the ones that are in the center. Uh, one strategy for dealing with this is actually just to add window margins onto the sides and to make that trapezoid a bit wider so you get even transmission across this larger range. Um, and so the way that you would do that is by adding half a Dalton or, or a full uh, MZ on each of the different fragment ions. So if you were doing 24 MZ wide windows, you might increase that to 26 MZ wide windows and 25 MZ wide windows, but still stagger them in the same way um, so that you have a little bit of slop on the edges. Again, this is a strategy that really kind of wreaks havoc on the overlapping scheme approach. So. Uh, again, this is a situation where you should either do overlapping or margins, not, not one or the other. Um, uh, so, because we still have this issue, and I think, as I said yesterday, this is more an issue with older quads, less of an issue with newer quads, like on the QE uh, plus on. Um, uh, there is another way to sort of deal with that, and that is to do these optimized window boundaries. And I showed you in the Skyline doc uh, where you actually saw um, the checkbox for generating these. Um, but uh, the idea is peptides are all made of the same stuff. It's all made of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. Um, and because that, there's only so many configurations that you can make them into. And so there end up being these sort of mass gaps and if this is looked across an entire proteome's worth of peptides, um, the range from 600 to 610 MZ, there are these gaps where you tend not to see peptides that are plus 2 or plus 3 or plus 4. So these regions right here are where you actually want to make the call for, that's where I should specify where um, I could set my window boundaries. And then I don't expect peptides to be in the window boundaries, so I don't have to worry about adding in margins. Does that make sense? So, Basically, um, if you check that one box, it just shifts the nominal mass. Say you are looking for the mass of 600. It shifts it up to 600.45 or whatever it is that fits in that optimal range right there um, so that it, it won't collide with many peptides and therefore you don't have to worry so much about window boundaries. So we, uh, I think for the most part, are advocating this idea of doing this optimization and then doing the overlap optimization. But I think Rudy's strategy of using variable width windows and window margins is another good way to do this um, as well. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I made this as well. Uh, Jarrett, actually, and his name comes up a lot these days, uh, uh, came up with this uh, idea for a totally different application. Um, and published that in Jasmus in, I think, 2015 or 14. Uh, he was doing it to, to actually try to sneak out some higher mass accuracy out of old linear ion traps. Um, but we found that this approach actually, so he was basically trying to use these mass defect holes, so where you saw a hole, to actually align all of the spectra um, in a DDA run using an LTQ. Uh, with the intention of being able to correct the masses so that he could actually get full mass, like one MC wide window 
um, accuracy or uh, sub MZY accuracy. It's a pretty cool paper. I uh, should have published higher, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'll also point out too that this was actually derived. Jimmy Yang noticed this when he was doing the original sequence algorithm, and he set the bit width in the sequence plus correlation to being 1.0005 because of the yeah, they just never put that in the manuscript. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that was actually worked out by uh, a student in Phil Green's lab, uh, who was actually the person that developed for a bunch of Bill's read editor and Bill's assembly program. Oh, that's cool. Except, well, the human genome project, it was just another student happened to be hearing about what the Green's lab was doing and did a separate analysis and noticed that. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so there are definitely a bunch of these, these holes. You can take advantage of them. Um, Okay, so, uh, great. We've got a little bit of extra time, so I'm going to talk a, a bit about some additional things, but I just wanted to kind of cover this. Um, just to recap, we talked a bit about why you need 68 points across the peak and why we think that 400 to 1,000 is actually a pretty good mass range to use um, and why you might want to make different choices from these 24 MZY overlapped uh, windows, um, as well as these sort of different schemes that you can generate. So variable width windows, overlapping windows, and these margins, and different optimized <coughs> Okay. That is uh, just a schematic for that. Um, I, I promised you guys that I would talk a little bit about this, uh, and so I want to just cover this briefly. Um, the idea of, can we detect peptides without actually having a library? Um, so I put this up here as uh, all triptych peptides um, we probably didn't want to do this, uh, and and I, actually I think we've demonstrated that this is actually kind of possible to do. Um, you just have to think about it, you have to do the statistics well. Um, so there are a bunch of things that we have to fight here, which is that if you're doing library searching using Skyline or whatever, um, you end up with... Uh, uh, you know, 10,000 peptides or 100,000 peptides in a spectrum library. Um, you get some big advantages where you've got known fragmentation and, and retention times. Um, however, trying to develop these libraries takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and you got to do, you know, heavy fractionation. Um, and it's really hard to generate these peptide libraries for uh, peptides that are different from what everyone else has generated in the past. So if you wanted to encapsulate all sequence variants that you would expect to see, or if you wanted to encapsulate a new model organism that no one has really studied. Um, uh, so that can be kind of a problem. I was actually just working on a data set that was from a malarian parasite, uh, and there really aren't libraries out there for that. No one has generated a good proteome for that data set. But there is a good genome for that data set, or for that um, uh, species. So. Uh, that's why we might be interested in stuff like this uh, to, to be able to detect peptides directly. We talked a little bit about DI Empire, which is a method to detect peptides directly using a spectrum-centric approach. But again, that requires a precursor, too. Um, uh, we published this paper on PECAN, which is another approach to do that. Um, uh, there are some of these issues that we had to think about before, which was that you had to... Um, deal with, uh, you know, vast number more peptides to be able to search, but that you could look for things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to find in libraries, like spanning splice junctions, um, where those peptides across a junction might never have been seen before by another researcher, because maybe someone never thought to put them into a FASTA database before um, in their DDA searches. Um, and you can look at things like sequence variants. Uh, that said, I, I want to say that, that this is slower than searching with a library. It's also less sensitive than searching with a library. So you need to have like a pretty good reason for wanting to do this. Um, because typically you would want to search for every peptide in a uh, genome. So, you would want to search for every peptide in the human genome rather than the 100,000 peptides that are in the pan-human library. So that's an order of magnitude difference there, just for the straight triptych peptides, let alone if you wanted to think about the phospho peptides or something like that. Um, 
yeah, so it sort of changes what you have to do to do the measurements. Uh, this is something where I don't think that you can use something like mProfit with the normal assumptions, so the, the normal distribution assumptions and all those sort of other things. Here uh, in Pecan, we actually ended up using Percolator as our statistical measurement and generating a bunch of different types of features that are sort of more useful for deciding is this spectrum actually likely to have, or what is the likelihood that these fragment ions would have been observed by chance all co-alluding together. Okay. Um, so that's already published. Uh, we put that out a couple years ago. Um, and there's a tool that you can use in conjunction with Skyline, actually. So you can run the analysis in Pecan and then load the data into Skyline to do visualization for afterwards. And that's actually a pretty nice combination. Um, but one of the things we found out was that Pecan actually does really well with this idea called gas-based fractionation. Um, and so instead of, and I want to talk about, about that because I think it's a pretty useful measurement. Um, so if you were trying to do 24 MC wide windows uh, across this 24, uh, 400 to 1,000 range, um, the idea would be to shrink this down into two different acquisitions. So you could do the same thing in one acquisition of 400 to 700 using 12 MC wide windows, and in a second acquisition do 700 to 1,000. So you have to waste twice as much sample, or you have to spend twice as much sample, you have to spend twice as much uh, instrument time to actually do the acquisition, but it's, um, it, it gives you, you know, much better isolation, a much better chance of seeing a peptide on its own. Uh, what we find is that using DIA with Pecan, you actually end up maybe not doing as well if you're doing a wide window search, like a, a 400 to 1000 MZ wide search, um, as you would typically with a normal DDA run. But DDA tends not to benefit from this idea of gas phase fractionation, so segmenting into different windows. This would be the detections from one gas phase fraction. This is if you're using two gas phase fractions in com combination. This is if you're using four. It does a little bit better, but not much better. And it's still overwhelmed by the sort of stochasticity, the random sampling involved. One of the things that's kind of cool is that with Pecan, you're basically every time you're increasing with gas phase fractionation, you actually get a, just a much bigger bubble, um, and that each of these different bubbles actually gets sequentially larger. It's not like you are losing out on peptides that you weren't seeing before. Um, so there's there are very few peptides, for example, that are identified only in the single gas phase fraction. Those are probably all wrong or errors, right? That's the 1% FDR uh, peptides. Whereas you still get a bunch of these peptides that are only detected in this one acquisition with DDA just because they just happen to sample in that stochastic sampling scheme. And this actually gets a lot cleaner if you're looking at, um, at protein aggregation. So with proteins, again, you do get a little bit of an increase in number of detections using gas-based fractionation, but you get a pretty staggering increase. Um, with multiple protein, uh, with protein detections using multiple injections, um, such that typically we find that you do, if you're spending up to four or five injections, you actually get more detections than you would with DDA in general, despite the fact that this individual injection with one measurement actually doesn't do as well. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so some people have done that experiment. Um, what they find is actually that uh, DDA starts to get better um, uh, at basically similar rates as Pecan does, um, and that, that they're both sort of reasonable ways of deciding uh, to build a library, but there's a lot more randomness involved in that process. So if you were to do that day one, uh, you would get probably a different set of fractions or different peptides in your fractions than day two. And that's maybe not a good place to be if you're trying to do quantitation on those measurements. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, I think, is probably the biggest issue. Um, but in terms of library generation, I think that that's, that's good. 
Uh, and I think people have determined so far that with pecan, um, you can actually build libraries that are on the order of what you would get with heavy fractionation. And I, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in this next slide. Um, this is actually a slide stolen from Mike. Hopefully Mike's not going to use it. <laughs> um, uh, Mike talks about this idea of the promise of DIA. This is a picture from uh, the last inauguration. Um, there's, there's Obama squinting over here and Trump giving his little speech over here in his uh, 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 tie. Um, uh, realistically, so this is sort of like the promise is you can drill into these, these captured libraries, these captured pictures, and be able to detect every single peptide that's present in them. And really, the, the data is just actually a lot lower resolution than we think it is. Um, and so this is actually sort of what we're seeing for Obama, and this is what we're seeing for Trump. And so the question is, if you're trying to like look up this in a spectrum library or in a FASTA database, and this is what you've got for your spectrum library, it's really hard to say that this is the same as, this Obama is the same as this Obama, right? Does that sort of make sense? Because you've acquired them under pretty different considerations, different fragmentation patterns, you're gonna get um, different retention times from a different column. They're fuzzy pictures, they don't look exactly the same. Um, okay, so this idea of gas phase fractionation, if you were to sort of scale this up pretty far, um, so here I'm doing uh, six injections of four MC wide isolation. Uh, six injections of 4-MC wide isolation, especially if they're overlapped. 4-MC wide isolation would give you 2-MC wide precursor isolation windows. 2-MC wide precursor isolation windows is effectively doing PRM, right? PRM you're using, you know, plus or minus 0.8 on either side. This is the same basic level of isolation, except instead of doing PRM on a handful of peptides, we're talking about in this experiment doing PRM on the entire proteome, right, effectively. Um, and so, because of that, we're getting the sensitivity of PRM and the, the ability to detect peptides. We're also going to get, you know, a quantitative measurement about uh, what ions are, are interfered with, and uh, and we get staggered multiple scans in a row, so it's much easier to make those detections out of those peptides. So this is uh, a, a very deep sampling of it. It costs six injections, but it's probably the most robust type of measurement that we could generate for something like this. You wouldn't want to do this for your quantitative samples. This takes six injections, it's way too much sample, it would be too too much of a trouble. Um, but you can make really good detections out of this set. And so we've settled on the strategy that we just published last year, which is this idea of if you've got you know 40 or 50 different quantitative samples, um, you'll run them one, you know, like in a normal scheme, you'll run them uh, in the 400 to 1,000 single injection runs and analyze them. Um, but we advocate for this idea of, of from each of these quantitative samples, taking uh, a sub-alpha off of each one of them, so like a microliter out of each one of those files, pooling them together, and then analyzing that pool in this six gas phase fractionation, deep, almost PRM-style approach, doing detection out of that using pecan, or using um, a spectrum library, and coming up with a, effectively this on-column chromatogram library, or a DIA-based library. Um, because these are acquired in DIA, and these are acquired in DIA. You can actually use, uh, okay, great. Um, the, uh, I just need two minutes. Um, you can use the uh, detections that you make over here because they have exactly the same fragmentation patterns and exactly the same uh, uh, retention times as you would expect over here. It's much easier to make the call as to where that peptide is. So you can just effectively look up the peptides that are in your library in your wide window DIA runs. And it makes it so that effectively when you're looking at that zoomed in region, if you were to break that up into these different chromatogram regions, it makes it so that you can actually look at a much deeper image of what that section of the proteome actually looks like on your instrument, on your, yeah. I'm really sorry, I got a bit lost in gas phase fractionation. Mm -hmm. Just for the one among us, can explain it again to me? Yeah, 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 so. Sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, you just take the same sample, and instead of acquiring with 24 MZ wide windows, you acquire it with 4 MZ wide windows, yeah, yeah. do it six times, stagger them across. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Good Little Lab published the Pacific. Yes. Good Little Lab called this the Pacific Method. They published this about 10 years ago. Oh, okay. Um, they were doing this, and I talked about that yesterday. <laughs> yeah, 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 Pacific. Yeah. yeah. Same idea. Um, but the idea is that it's much easier to say that this Obama actually is the same as this Obama from the library if you have a high resolution picture of what that should look like. And then it's much easier to say this Obama is the same as this Obama now, right? Because you've got a picture of what it looks like in your sample, in your matrix, uh, with your column, with your instrument. Uh, so we get much higher levels of, of retention time accuracy with this. So we get, instead of talking about five MZ wide windows, we're talking about 20 second MZ, or five minute windows, we're talking about 20 second windows. Um, and the same thing goes with fragmentation. You get much better fragmentation um, accuracy uh, with correlation um, for those peptides. So um, with that, we're going to skip to the next session. We're going to go on a break and then talk about some data afterwards. Uh, when you come in for the break, um, I'm going to have two stacks of piles here uh, for QE users and TOF users. We've got two different data sets for you to play around with depending on what you're interested in looking at that type of data. Okay? Um, cool.